Hi, good evening, everyone. We are beginning the Bible class now. You may have heard me come on a few moments before uh, testing a microphone that I have uh, trying to just improve the sound that we have since we're doing a lot of these online uh, activities. Um, speaking of that, I'm going to mention this later on. Um, this is the last class for Isaiah. Um, we have gone through Isaiah together since last September. And we've gone through the entire book, 66 chapters. This is the longest book I ever did on a Bible class. And uh, I have been, enjoyed it immensely. I have learned so much about Isaiah myself. And for those of you who have been there since the beginning, I hope you have learned something also. Uh, it's been a great privilege uh, teaching this class. I'm going to miss Isaiah. I feel like I've gotten to know him pretty well, his style of writing and uh, what he's focusing on, what the Lord is telling him. But the good news is, is after this class ends, normally I would end for the summer my Bible class and I enjoy a little lighter schedule in the summer. But because of this pandemic and things what they are, I am going to press on with a Bible class this summer. And for the first time, we are going to be able to meet live. Yes, that is correct. Meet live starting next Monday. It's going to be in the Syasa campus and it's going to be in the sanctuary. Um, we're going to have social distancing still. Uh, the law from New York State allows us to have 25% of capacity in a room. And since uh, the bottom floor of Syasa holds 200 people, actually a little bit more, but we'll, we'll have seating for 50. That doesn't mean 50 will come, but we'll have 50 seats available. And we're still going to be online. Um, so if you want to participate in that, you are welcome to come and see people again. Now, one of the things we consulted with a team of doctors that attend Shelter Rock Church, and their feeling was we should still wear facial masks. Now, things in New York State are in flux on facial masks. I understand that that is changing. However, for the time being, minimally, our first class will be asking everyone uh, to have a face mask on. And I'll say that if you're coming in and out of the building to have a face mask on, if you're sitting by yourself and you're, you know, you're nowhere with, around you for six feet, you can take the mask off at your seat. But we're not going to be singing, so we're not going to be projecting. Um, but we want to exercise good caution coming in and out of the building. We want to protect your health and uh, our health and uh, just keep a good, healthy atmosphere. So what are we going to be studying? We're going to be studying the book of Zechariah. Now, I asked some people for feedback. What do you think we should study? And people gave me lots of choices, almost all of them in the New Testament. And uh, as I looked at all the choices that people gave, I kind of picked one that nobody picked. And the reason was Pastor Jack preached from Zechariah, and it kind of whet my appetite for doing Zechariah. And I have things to learn about that book myself, and it's 14 chapters, so it takes us uh, deep into the summer and gives us a chance to discover um, another perspective of a prophet, a post-exilic prophet, um, which lends itself to the time period we've been studying in the book of Isaiah. And I think there'll be some great things ahead as we study together. So once again, we are going to be live next Monday night at the Manhasset, excuse me, correction, at the Syasa campus at 7.30 p.m. However, you can still watch online. I still will have the video available that will enable anyone who just wants to tune in to tune in and enjoy the uh, class. We've been doing that for years, and so that's nothing new, actually. What will be new for me is actually having people in the class that I am teaching, and I'm truly looking forward uh, to that. So with that in mind, let's open in prayer and begin our class this evening. Father, uh, that's good news for us, that we can meet together. Lord, I have missed being with your people. Father, I look forward to seeing friends and and just experiencing uh, just a, the privilege of spending time together with friends. Uh, Lord, we long for this pandemic to be over. We long for peace in our country, for riots to be a thing of the past. And yet, Lord, we also recognize that these things that are taking place are ultimately a result of sin. 
Yes, even the pandemic, because of the fall in Genesis, we believe that that made this whole world subject to pain and, and grief, um, going through travail, as the scripture says. And we look at the results of racism and, and inappropriate behavior by certain police officers, and we realize that's sin. We look at looters and we say that's sin, and we realize that we are in a broken world. And Father, the way we get out of this broken world is not going to be uh, be nice to each other seminars. It's going to be a people that come together and say, I am a sinner and I need a savior. And then allow the Holy Spirit to work within each man and woman, each student. Father, we pray that you would start your work in us. Bring revival to your church. May we love one another. May we express kindness one to another. And Father, I pray that all of us, by your Spirit, would seek to become men and women known for our extraordinary love, even for people that believe different than us or act unbecomingly. Father, may we be part of a solution, not part of a problem. So Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Guide us tonight as we wrap up the book of Isaiah. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I am grateful that you're here, and we're grateful to start. And as always, we always start with a quiz. And the reason we start with a quiz is because we're trying to reinforce knowledge. Now, back in the day, and some of you will remember this, I used to give a final exam on the last day of class. And uh, making this final exam... I would hand it out, and for those who wanted to stay and take it, they took it. It would take maybe, a, not too long, 20 minutes. But the bottom line is maybe three people would stay of the entire class. Most people are like, you know, Pastor Steve, I don't really want to take a final exam. So we're not giving a final exam today, but we are having our final quiz. And once again, the point of a quiz is to remember what we should be learning, to see if we can build on the knowledge and of course, my sadistic tendencies. So let's dig into the quiz. Um, and if you're ever plugging along on one of my classes, you find these quizzes on our webpage. Uh, you go to resources, midweek Bible class, and the most recent quiz will be posted there. And you can also see last week's lesson, which will be in the priority position of uh, videos to watch. All right, with that in mind, let's look at our quiz and uh, see what we can do in terms of uh, discovering our answers. Here we go. Pastor Steve has made the case that Isaiah has three parts. Where are the divisions? Okay, making the case that Isaiah has three parts, where do you put the lines? Is it Isaiah 1 to 30, 31 to 40, 41 to 66, or is it Isaiah 1 to 39? 40 to 55, 56 to 66, or 1 to 39, 40 to 52, 53 to 66, or the last one, 1 to 6, 7 to 39, 40 to 66. All right, you have your three choices, and the winner is, it is Isaiah, 1 to 39. In this part of Isaiah, Isaiah is like a temple, a court uh, prophet. He is challenging kings, and he is pushing them to uh, move to following the Lord, listen to the Lord. And then on Isaiah 40 to 55, it is an amazing section where we're introduced to the servant, which we believe ultimately is none other than Jesus Christ, but we're also challenged to put aside idolatry and we are to trust the Lord who can predict the future. We are introduced to a king that is not even born yet, who is going to be the king named by name by Isaiah as the one who's going to release the Israelites from a captivity that they're not even on yet. And then finally, on chapters 56 to 66, how do we live in the kingdom? In other words, now that you're coming back from Babylon to Jerusalem, how should you live? And that is what we're uh, in right now. So... That is the answer for number one. Number two, Edom is representative of all that is good in the world, B, nations that repent, C, nations at war with Israel, 
or D, nations of red people? And the answer is nations at war with Israel. So last week we talked about it. Why is this king uh, whose robes are uh, dipped? And I won't get into that because that's another question. But why is this king coming from Edom? And it's just a symbol that this king is victorious over the enemies of Israel. Now, the one with red is intentional because if you're really, really sharp in your Bible knowledge, red also is what Edom means. Um, and so there's a, a, a double meaning there. But that's not the right answer. So, number three. The image of the wine press that Isaiah uses is picked up by A, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, B, the book of the Revelation, C, the Gospel of John, or D, the Gospel of Luke. And what is it? It is the book of the Revelation. Yes, John picks up on that in his book, Revelation, not in his Gospel. Um, and you see uh, a beautiful imagery. I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. The book of Revelation alludes to the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament. However, it doesn't directly quote the Old Testament, but you can see the imagery picked up on a regular basis. Okay, number four. Isaiah is unique in the Old Testament in calling the Spirit of God A, holy, B, wind, C, powerful, or D, grievable. So which you want to think it is? And the answer is, it is A and D. A and D. Calling the Spirit the Holy Spirit shows up rather frequently in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, it only shows up three times. And two of the times are what we had last week. The only other place it shows up is when David is repenting in Psalm 51, and he says, please do not take your Holy Spirit from me. But in the Isaiah passage, it also refers to the Holy Spirit able to be grieved by us, the people. Now, the New Testament talks about grieving the Spirit, but this again comes from Isaiah. And by the way, when you read the Apostle Paul in his many, many books, so uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, uh, Philemon, uh, Romans. These books, you will find out. Paul reads a lot of Isaiah. I mean, he's quoting Isaiah regularly. In fact, he's going to quote it tonight. The passage we're going to look at, Paul will make reference to. So clearly, in his studying under Gamaliel, uh, revered. Jewish scholar of Paul's day, and Paul was a student, he is one who has clearly learned, memorized, and uses the book of Isaiah to develop a lot of his theology. Uh, very powerful. Number five, number five, Isaiah calls the Lord, A, our friend, B, our father, C, our brother, D, our second cousin once removed. Now, if you put the last one, you may hang your head in shame right now. So I doubt many of you put that one. But the answer is our father. Now, why is that important? That's a fairly unique use of calling God our father. Now, the, the Jews had a deep concept that God is the father but they didn't refer to him that way. Jesus was actually the revolutionary who said, you may pray saying, our father. Now, Isaiah isn't praying to the father, but he refers to him as a father. So it's a, it's a unique usage in the Old Testament, which ultimately has its uh, culmination in Jesus and his teaching. All right, number six. According to Isaiah... Our righteousness is like snow, a sweet fragrance before the Lord, oil running down Aaron's beard, filthy rags. So which one of those do you think it is? And the answer is filthy rags. Now the others 
Though your sins be as scarlet, Isaiah says, they shall be white as snow. But no, he's not referring to our sins, and they shall be white as snow. That's because of the grace of God. And it is not a sweet fragrance before the Lord, because we don't have any righteousness in our own. And it is not oil running down Aaron's beard, which is a reference to a psalm, which referring to when God's people are, are working together and it just referring to just a beautiful thing of when Aaron is anointed with oil and the, and the beard is being covered with it, that oil. All in all, Isaiah and Paul picks up on this motif, sees our righteousness as filthy rags. We don't bring anything to the table. We are completely dependent on the Lord. I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your sins. But then comes that beautiful two words, but God in his kindness provided a way of salvation through Jesus Christ. All right, number seven. Quote, no one has heard, no eye has seen, is picked up by what New Testament writer? So that was a quote from what we studied last week. And who quotes that? Paul, Peter, John, James. And the answer is, I kind of hinted in the sense that Paul quotes this guy a lot. It's the Apostle Paul. And so Paul picks up on that and does quote this. And that one shows up, I believe, in Corinthians. All right, number eight. According to Isaiah, we are, A, like rocks, B, like trees, C, like clay, D, like grass. So two of these are right. And the first one that's right, we studied last week. But there's another one Isaiah says, not this week, but he said it in the past, and so we have to include it. And that is, we are like clay and like grass. We are like clay and that there's a potter who's molding us. And we are like grass and that we are here today and gone tomorrow, that our lives are temporal. But both of those are themes that come from the book of Isaiah. Number nine. The dominant character of the second half of Isaiah is King Hezekiah, the servant, Isaiah himself, King Cyrus. So what's the dominant character of the second half of Isaiah, which goes from chapter 40 to the end? And the answer is the servant. The servant is mostly developed in chapters 40 through 55 but shows up regularly in chapters 56 to 66. We see that in a number of dialogues. Although in that last part, he's a little more cryptic. He doesn't always refer to this person as the servant, but when you put together the clues of the text, it clearly is the servant. Finally, number 10. Who is called Hephzibah? Who is called Hephzibah? Israel? We are the enemies of God, Beulah. And the answer is Israel. And by way of understanding the passage, we are. And it's a beautiful phrase. It means the desired one or desired of God. And uh, Beulah was also in that context, but Beulah means married, married. And so the, who is called Hephzibah? It is Israel and it, we are. Because we're grafted in, the Apostle Paul says, so we get to be part of the blessings that Israel has received. So I wonder how you did on the quiz. I hope you did pretty good. Um, tonight we are going to wrap up the book of Isaiah. So if you have a Bible, open it now to chapter 65. 65. And I'm going to read uh, sections of it, and then we're going to break it down. But before I do, I want to reiterate what I said in the beginning of class, in case you're tuning in. This is the last Isaiah class. And normally, I stop here and take a break for the summer. But because of the pandemic, we're going to press on. And next week, 
For the first time in a long time, the class is going live, and it's going to be held at the Syosset campus in the sanctuary. We can handle up to 50 people in the room. Not that there's going to be 50 people, but we're making that available for anyone who wants to come. And uh, we're going to do the book of Zechariah. And looking forward to it. And I, I hope you can be a part, whether you're going to be watching online, which is going to still be available, or whether you're going to come. Uh, we are going to be practicing social distancing, and you will need to bring a mask with you. Once you get settled in your seat, if you're more than six feet away from the next person, you can take the mask off and, you know, enjoy just normal breathing there. But if you're going to sit close to people that are not part of your family unit, we ask that you keep the mask on. And that's just simple, good practice recommended by our team of doctors helping us at the church. Okay, with that in mind, let's dig into our passage, which is Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. It starts this way. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me, to a nation that did not call on my name. I said, here am I, here am I. All day long, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs whose, and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too scared sacred for you. Such people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all night. See, it stands written before me. I will not keep silent, but will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps. Both your sins and the sins of your ancestors, says the Lord, because they burned sacrifices on the mountains and defied me on the hills. I will measure into their laps the full payment for their former deeds. This is what the Lord says. As when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes and the people say, don't destroy it, there is still a blessing in it, so will I, in behalf of my servants, will I will not destroy them all. All right, I'm going to pause there. We're going to come back, obviously, to continue on. But I want to go to the beginning of this section um, and... What is happening in verse 65 is the Lord is speaking. And we're dealing with, just to bring you up to speed, the people of Israel were in captivity in Babylon. And I've called time and time again Isaiah part 2, chapters 40 to 66. Isaiah's love letter to the future. That first part of Isaiah part 2 was to inspire us by introducing us to a man, a, a servant, who is going to be exemplary and bringing salvation to the people. But the second part of Isaiah, of that second part of Isaiah, we could call it the third part of Isaiah, is Isaiah giving this challenge of what does kingdom living look like? And so when they're coming back from Babylon, it is not that these people are now pure and they're all perfect and they got it all figured out. They haven't got it all figured out. So Isaiah in a gracious act of God, giving this prophet a word for a future generation, is challenging them to be a people that reflect God, that are becoming more like the God that they serve. And how do you do this? Is it through religious perfection? Absolutely not. It is actually through having a contrite heart, which is going to come up again tonight. But right now, as we look at this passage, our primary goal is to consider what is it that is being said to us. This is one of these passages that I, I use the morning quiet time test. If what I just read was your morning quiet time and you got a journal next to you and you're trying to write down some notes, what did I learn today in the quiet time while I'm eating my buttered bagel? You might say, well, I, I'm not really sure. I'm a little confused. 
But what's happening is that God is responding to them. In other words, a prayer that they made. And, and I want to draw your attention. This came from Isaiah 63. And Isaiah is probably the one speaking in this. But this is the words. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so that we do not revere you? Now, the speaker here, again, possibly Isaiah, praying on behalf of the people, is asking God a question. Is it all fixed? Is the path that we have right now just set for us? And in this particular case, you caused us to stumble. You hardened our hearts. And as a result, we fell and ended up in captivity. Is that what happened, Lord? And for a while, the Lord does not respond. We hear more prayers, more response to prayer. And uh, eventually, Isaiah gives this cry, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. Fix this broken world. And last week, remember, we prayed that prayer because we want the Lord to do that now. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Take us out of this pandemic. Take us out of this hate and, and disturbing things that we see all around us. But it is in chapter 65, about a chapter and a half later, that the Lord responds. And the response is how we begin. If you notice, chapter 65 opens with a quote. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. So pause there for a moment. That quote is God speaking. And what's interesting, this is used by the Apostle Paul in Romans. So in Romans, here's Paul quoting this. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I reveal myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now, that's Paul quoting this passage. I tell you, Paul likes the book of Isaiah. What is God saying? So he's responding to what they said. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? And what he says is the words that Paul's quoting behind me. I did reveal myself to those who did not ask for me. And it was people who weren't even looking for me I revealed myself to. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name. I said, here am I. Here am I. Last week, I took that as really good news. Because there's a lot of people I know in my life who don't seek God. Some of them are precious to me. And I want them to seek God because I want them to be in the fellowship with us. I want to see them in heaven. I just want to know that their, their souls are secure. But this verse gives me comfort because God reveals himself to people not even pursuing him. Yes. Now, he gives a promise. You will find me if you seek me with all your heart. But here's a challenge that God says, you know what? I'm even pursuing people who are not looking for me. And so thank you, Lord, that you do that in our world. Verse 2 of 65. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. And so now what he's going to do is describe what he's seeing in the people of Israel. And it could be referring to the people while they're still in Babylon or maybe early into their time of coming back to Jerusalem. But this is what the Lord observes. A people, verse 3, who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens, which is another way of saying pagan worship, and burning incense on altars of brick, the incense altars of the Lord are supposed to be natural stones. So brick might imply the, the worship in Babylon because Babylonians were big on using bricks. Um, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil. Now everything that he's using here right now, this is the Lord speaking, but it dripping with sarcasm. Because the Jewish people probably would be hesitant about some of the things 
that I'm about to read, but the Lord is making, that's the equivalent of what you're doing. Who eat the flesh of pigs. Now, if you're a good Jew, you don't eat bacon. You do not eat pigs. Whose pots hold broth of impure meat. In other words, these people have no desire to keep the covenant. Who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too scared for you. Now, this, uh, excuse me, I said that wrong. Too sacred for you. Too sacred for you. In other words, these are snobs. There are people who think that they're religious. And on the other hand, they are not following the ways of the Lord at all. Now, is the Lord asking for them to be perfect in terms of their keeping of the Torah? Here is why we think he's speaking sarcastically here. Because they would probably respond, Lord, we don't eat pig. Lord, we don't sit among the graves and soil ourselves. We don't defile ourselves that way. Well, the Lord has already talked about this previously in Isaiah, that what he's looking for is, is caring for the poor, caring for the homeless, caring for the widow, caring for the orphan. orphan. That's the kind of things he's looking for. But these people are acting so pious that he is kind of just ratcheting the bar and saying what you're doing is the equivalent of eating pig. Don't give me this pious thing. You guys think you're too sacred for anyone and nobody can come near to you. And so he says this. Uh, Such a people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all night. See, it stands written before me. This is verse 6. I will not keep silent, but I will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps, both your sins and the sins of your ancestors, says the Lord. Very simple thing. Sin has repercussions, and the Lord is saying, I will come in judgment. I will come as a reaper to bring judgment. Now, the book of Revelation picks up on this theme of God bringing judgment and then kind of carries it ultimately to that ultimate uh, dimension of there being a heaven and there being a hell. We're going to wrap up Isaiah tonight with that theme. We'll talk about that in a little while. But right now the Lord is just saying, I have been appealing to you. I have been calling to you and saying, here am I, here am I. But you guys have been consumed with thinking that you're pious, but in actuality, the kind of things you're doing, you might as well be having a pig roast because you're not following my ways. So we go on here in verse 8. This is what the Lord says. And now comes some good news, friends. you just been beaten up a little bit. Here comes some good news. As when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes, and people say, don't destroy it. There is still a blessing in it. So will I do in behalf of my servants. I will not destroy them all. It's funny, as I was preparing this message tonight in terms of my studying, I'm sitting at my table in the kitchen. I was eating grapes. And they were good grapes. You know, the kind that you bite into and it has a splash, you know, that burst of juice that fills your mouth and is like wonderful. And you appreciate it. And it's, it's glorious. And here's what God says. He says, if there's any juice left at all, I'm not destroying those grapes. I'll keep those grapes. Because I believe there's something that could be done with those grapes. If you're that person that is pretty worn out and you don't have much left, God does not cast aside those who have that little bit of juice left in them. But where I take, again, comfort in that are those in my life that I love that seem to have wandered away. But I, I do see a little juice left in them. And I see in this verse mercy that God has for people like that. So we move on now, and I'm going to continue reading. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah and those who possess my mountains. My chosen people will inherit them. And there will my servants live. Sharon will become a pasture for flocks, and the valley of Achor a resting place for herds. For my people who seek me, 
But as for you who forsake the Lord and forget my holy mountain, who spread a table for fortune and fill bowls of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword. And all of you will fall, fall by my in the slaughter. For I called you, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My servants will eat, but you will go hungry. My servants will drink, but you will go thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. My servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts, but you will cry out from anguish of heart and wail in brokenness of spirit. You will leave your name for my chosen ones to use in their curses. The sovereign Lord will put you to death, but to his servants he will give another name. Whoever invokes a blessing in the land will do so by the one true God. Whoever takes an oath in the land will swear by the one true God. For the past troubles will be forgotten and hidden from my eyes. Okay, I'm going to stop there. We have a new heading coming right up next to that. And this is that challenge, a contrast between the followers or the servants of God and those who don't want to follow him. So our section that I just finished reading, going back to verse 9, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and Judah and will possess the mountains. My chosen people will inherit them. And it says, they will live there. Uh, there will my servants live. And it's going to be good. It's going to be great. And he says here some things which are probably cryptic to you. Sharon will become a pasture for flocks and the Valley of Achor a resting place for herds. Now, did you ever hear of this phrase, uh, the Rose of Sharon? The Rose of Sharon. Now, what is that? Sharon is a place. Uh, let me show you this place. And this is a modern picture of Sharon. This is basically Israel. And I, I stole a picture, you might say, uh, Alame written all over here. But the point of this, it's a fertile land. It's a blessed land. It is in Israel to this day where they, they grow delicious oranges and other fruits and, and vegetables. It's, it's a beautiful place. It is on the coastal plain. In the old days, this is where the Philistines lived. But by the time of Solomon, it became all of Israel. Now here is in a map what it looks like. And so if you can see uh, where you see uh, the lines, the red lines in the map, that's showing you the modern Palestinian area, but this was all of Israel. You see up here the Sea of Galilee, down below you see the Dead Sea, but this is the Plain of Sharon, so this is what he's referring to. But it's, it's, you don't have to be literal with this. The whole point is that this is talking about it's going to be a good place that I'm giving to you guys. But as he's talking about how beautiful the land is and how nice it is, verse 11, now comes the contrast. But as for you who forsake the Lord and forget my holy mountain, that would probably be referring to Mount Zion or the, the Temple Mount, who spread a table for fortune and fill mixed bowls of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine to the sword. Very simple. What he's saying here is there is a choice before you. You can choose to worship me on my holy mountain in Mount Zion, or you can pursue the almighty dollar. You can pursue wealth. You can pursue nice bowls of wine for yourself. And for your destiny, drink to your future. And the Lord says, yeah, I will give you a destiny, a destiny for the sword. And all of you will fall in the slaughter. For I called but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Now, the next verses are just a simple contrast. Two kinds of people. Those who choose to follow the Lord and those who do not. 
Remember what Jesus said at the end of times, the uh, angels will come and separate the good fish from the bad fish. This is what this is referring to. My servants will eat. Those are the ones who are following after God. But you will go hungry. My servants will drink. But you will go thirsty. My servants will rejoice. But you will be put to shame. You know, one of the arguments that I give for people who are in an atheistic or agnostic tradition, and we should love everyone, people who believe different, love your Islamic brother or sister, love your Buddhist friend, love your person into Shintoism, love your agnostic friend. But one of the things when I'm having a friendly conversation that I say, here's what sociologists tell us. If you are a religious person, you don't even have to get specific, but... Uh, I'll say, if you're a Christian, sociologists say your marriages tend to last longer, you tend to live longer, and you tend to be happier in your life. These things are not present for the atheist. My favorite Bertrand Russell quote is when he was interviewed in the BBC in his 80s. He was asked, as England's most famous atheist, now in your 80s, what do you have to look forward to? And Bertrand Russell said, I have nothing to look forward to except grim, unyielding despair. Whoa, how's that for a worldview? I'm choosing grim, unyielding despair. But those who follow the Lord, secular sociologists inform us and say they tend to be happier than their non-believing counterparts. And you know what? I, I will say to the agnostic, if I was not sure that there was a Jesus, that there was a God who sent Jesus, I think I would still follow this path because it means I'm going to have a better life. Why would I not choose the best life? But then once you choose, once you taste and see, then suddenly I think the magnificence of our God goes to an even higher level. But that's his, that's his challenge. Verse 14, my servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts, but you will cry out from anguish of heart and wail in brokenness of spirit. You will leave your name for my chosen ones to use it in their curses. <laughs> How's that for your legacy? You people who are making very, very bad choices, you will become the new curse words of a future generation of the servants, of the good people. And it says here, um, the sovereign Lord will put you to death. But to his servants, he will give another name. Now, that is an interesting statement because it kind of reminds us of the book of Revelation where there is a new name given to us, um, known only uh, to him. And, and here we get a, an allusion with that. Verse 16, whoever invokes a blessing in the land will do so by the one true God. Whoever takes an oath in the land will swear by the one true God. For the past troubles will be forgotten and hidden from my eyes. That's great news. We have all had difficult times. Some of us have been abused as children. Some of us have experienced abuse at some stage in our jobs. And some of us are living in abusive situations right now. But the Lord says those pains will no longer be remembered. You know, if you go to a counselor and they come from maybe a Freudian school, they will frequently talk about how, um, you know, tell us about your childhood and, and what happened. And then you say, well, I had an abusive dad or an alcoholic mother. And you, you go through your whole thing and you feel scars from that. Well, there's a day coming for those who are servants of the Lord where there will be no scars. The only scars that we'll be paying attention to are the scars on Jesus' hands, reminding us for all time that he died for our sins and that our past is paid for and gone and not remembered anymore. And so this is a, a beautiful passage saying that the servants of the Lord will have those dark, evil things that, you know, still wake us up in the middle of the night, wiped clear, and we will not see that anymore. So now comes a vision. Now this next section is curious for numerous reasons. It's curious because it's clearly used by the book of Revelation to talk about a glorious future. It clearly seems to be giving some kind of allusion to the people coming from Babylon back to Jerusalem. 
but it speaks in language that seems to go far beyond that. And so we're going to read it, and then we're going to dissect it a little bit, see if we can make some heads or tails out of it. Here we go. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem. I will take delight in my people, and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. And one who dies at a hundred will be thought to be, that was a mere child. One who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will the days of my people, my chosen ones, be long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord. They will and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will lie down uh, and will feed together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. There will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. Beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it's a nice picture of what is going on. But there's some mystery here as to what's unfolding. Because the section begins, verse 17, See, I will create new heavens and new earth. Now that does not sound like a people coming from Babylon back to Jerusalem, and now there's new heavens and new earth, and this happened around uh, 514 B.C. Just doesn't sound like it. The language is too strong. But there are those, and I, and I think they're partially right, who will say this is poetic language that is speaking in such a way to inspire people that when you leave Babylon and when you follow my ways, the going in Jerusalem is going to be good. You'll plant a vineyard, you'll eat from your vineyard. There'll be no enemy who takes away your crops. You are going to be in a time of peace, a time of blessing, a time of harvest. But then there are sections of this passage which seem to be beyond what happened when the people left Babylon and came to Jerusalem. For example, when it says in verse 20, Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years, or one who dies at a hundred, and we be thought to be a mere child, or one who fails to reach a hundred, be considered accursed. So here's the mystery here. This description doesn't sound like heaven because we know that heaven is a place of eternal life. We know that unequivocally from the New Testament and from many passages in the Old Testament. Do you remember when Jesus was debating with the Sadducees? And he says, you err because you do not know the scriptures. When God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. When Jesus said that, he conveyed that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive and well in the presence of God. So the Old Testament understands the presence of an eternal future with God. So what is going on here? Because we don't think that when they came back from Babylon to Jerusalem, people suddenly were living to a hundred or longer, you know, much longer based in this text, thought of as a mere child. Nor are we thinking that, you know, there was no stillborns or, the, you know, there were no miscarriages. You know, all those kinds of things don't seem to be what happened when that occurred. You know, that there was suddenly massive lifetimes. And so here is what is taking place 
of what we think. And I'm going to have to describe it because there's several schools of thought, okay? I'm going to bring my uh, whiteboard over, and so I, I hope you'll be able to, to see this. Is the first understanding is that this is a poem. And so as a poem, it's using hyperbolic language to convey that it's going to be good when they get to Jerusalem. So it's not meaning literally that they're going to be living to 100 years or well beyond, but they're going to have, generally speaking, long lives because there isn't going to be war and there's going to be plenty of food to feed people. So that's the one thought that's taking place here. The second thought, very common in evangelical circles, is that this is the millennium. And in the millennium is this period of time in which we will see uh, will, there'll still be people on earth. Now, let me show you a graph of this just to give you a, a depiction. Let me move up here. Here we are. So this is a, a depiction just from, uh, from fa uh, not Facebook, uh, Google image. Uh, from a, when you enter dis uh, dispensationalism. This is a common understanding among evangelical Christians. Debate it, and not all these aspects are believed and understood. And I know when you look at this graph, it is far more detailed for you to even have a chance of seeing online. I get that. But you can get the big picture of it. So here's the big picture. Here's the cross. So Jesus dies on the cross. He is buried. He is raised to new life. He ascends into heaven. Then... See that arrow coming down? That's the Holy Spirit coming into the church. And then we enter this period, which this map calls the dispensation of grace. That's what we're in now. That is where the gospel is going out and people are preaching and saying there's salvation under no other name except through Jesus Christ. And we're in that and the gospel message is going out. But then the day comes when there is this red thing here, you can hardly see it, I know, but that's the rapture. So one day, when people are least expecting it, the church, those who are followers, are raptured into glory. And then we enter into seven years of tribulation. And then at the end of the seven years of tribulation, that's when the, the, the Antichrist comes into being. That's what this little picture here is. Um, ultimately... Then the second coming of Christ comes. That's when the church comes and, the, and Jesus comes with his white horse and it's going to be great and returns everything. And then we enter into a period of 1,000 years. This is referred to in the book of Revelation, um, 1,000 years millennium. And this is a kingdom established in Revelation 11, 15, and, and 20 to 4. And so this 1,000 years is what's being talked about here in Isaiah where the saints are ruling and judging, but the people who are just living, it's just a glorious time. It is ultimately a time where people are living long lives, but the saints, they're eternal. They're, they're already beginning their eternal destiny. But those who are living uh, that time, that, that survived the tribulation and all that kind of stuff, they are the ones who are now living under the blessing of the, of the people of God and are living these exceedingly long lives. And then ultimately Satan is released and the bad sheep, the good sheep are separated and hell is, is thrown into the pit and then we move into the time of heaven and just glorious new heaven and new earth and, and all of its beauty and all of its wonder and uh, Satan is done away with, you know, all together. Okay, that is option number two. But then we have option three, and this is um, a little hard to understand. If you understand Reformed theology, it's called amillennialism, and that we are in the millennium now. And so uh, the time is now we are in it and what they mean by this is not that 
we're living well past 100, but that the world is getting better and better. And as a result of that, um, those things will come. They're, they're coming. And it's speaking in poetic language. It won't be exactly like that. But then ultimately the day comes and the second coming of Christ comes. And then we are in heaven. We are in the new heaven and the new earth. And it's going to be glorious and wonderful. So to, to reiterate, just to, to break it down again, the first understanding of this section of scripture is a poem. This poem just talks about how wonderful it's going to be when the people who are in captivity in Babylon get back to Jerusalem. And it uses hyperbolic language. That's another way of saying exaggerated language to say how great it's going to be. But number two is that this is referring to what well, we had this map over here, the millennium which is called dispensational theology, which many evangelicals hold to. And the third view is we're in the millennium now. Ah, millennialism means we're here, we're there. They don't take it as a literal thousand years. They see it as the period of time after the Holy Spirit ascends, uh, comes down to the church and is transforming this world. Now, you're asking, okay, Pastor Steve, which one is it? And wouldn't you love for me to like to give you that nice clear answer? Here's my nice muddy answer. I see elements of all three. I think this passage clearly is poetic and clearly is to encourage those coming back from Babylon. I think that's in the text. That's the context of what Isaiah is writing to. But I also see the possibility of a defined millennium. If people ask me, Pastor Steve, what are you when it comes to new old uh, end times? I call myself a historic premillennialist. And that is this idea of, I don't like to get into all the details of uh, the seven years uh, tribulation and, and when is the Antichrist coming and all those kind of things, because you get bogged down in that stuff and you miss the glorious aspect that Jesus is coming again and he's taking this upside down world and he's making it right side up. And so I, I see that millennium as a possibility, but I don't put all my eggs in that basket. But that last one, that we are in the millennium, on the one hand, that seems a little absurd to me, but I also get the point. And here's the point. Wherever Christians go, the world should get better, not worse. And I think, generally speaking, that has happened. You know, people complain about Christians and, you've done so much damage to the world. Well, you know what? Look at all the countries that have a Christian heritage. And you will find in those countries, women have the most freedom. Slavery was uh, gotten rid of at the earliest dates. You will find over and over, the Christian nations were the ones that got rid of that stuff first. And that is a beautiful thing. And here's what my one hesitancy of dispensationalism, which is the thing on the, on the map behind me, is people feel it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and then Christ will come. But our millennialists believe it should get better and better and better, and then Christ will come. Now, you may say, well, it feels like the dispensationalists are winning on that one. It doesn't seem to be getting better. And on the one hand, that may be right, because we're living in a sin-drenched world still. But you know where the amillennials are right? I mean, when Christians went to Africa, what did they do? They build hospitals. They care for the poor. I mean, Rwanda is expected within a few years that every single person is going to have clean drinking water. You know why? Christians have poured out their love on trying to help that people in Rwanda. That's an amazing thing. So yes, I believe there are elements of all three of these. But I truly believe that we should live anticipating that God is going to be coming to restore that which is broken, as a dispensationalist would believe. But we should also believe, like an amillennialist, that let's work now to see God's kingdom brought into our world. Okay, that wraps up that section of scripture. Um, and now uh, I want to mean uh, move uh, let me just wrap up a little bit more there because I didn't talk about the end of that. Verse 23, they will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. They will be a people blessed by the Lord and their descendants 
with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. That is a great verse to memorize. Okay? Here it is again. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. That's a promise of the Lord. And I believe he, he responds that way. The good verse to memorize. But now comes this vision of that glorious day. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. Well, today they feed together, except the wolf eats the lamb. But the day is coming when that will not happen. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. I guess we're going to be vegetarians of some sort then. And the dust will be the serpent's food. In other words, serpents won't be pursuing people. They'll be pursuing the dust of the earth. All of this is just a beautiful way of saying this last thing. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now comes the wrap-up of the book of Isaiah. You ready? Chapter 66, entitled in the NIV, Judgment and Hope. Here's what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where is my resting place to be? Has not my hand made all these things so that they came into being, declares the Lord? These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. But whoever sacrifices a bull like the one who kills a person and whoever offers a lamb like the one who breaks a dog's neck, whoever makes a grain offering is like the one who presents pig's blood, whoever burns memorial incense is like the one who worships an idol, they have chosen their own ways and they delight in their abominations. So I also will choose harsh treatment for them and, they will, and I will bring on them what they dread. For when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, no one listened. They did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your own people who hate you and exclude you because of my name have said, The Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. Yet they will be put to shame. Hear that uproar from the city. Hear that noise from the temple. It is the sound of the Lord repaying his enemies all they deserve. Before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son. Who has ever heard of such things? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. Do I bring to the moment of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Do I close up the womb when I bring to delivery, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice greatly with her, all you who mourn over her. For you will nurse and be satisfied at her comforting breasts and you will drink deeply in the delight of her overflowing abundance. This is what the Lord says, I will extend peace to her like a river, and wealth of nations like a flooding stream. You will nurse and be carried on her arm and uh, dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart will rejoice, and you will flourish like grass. The hands of the Lord will be made known to his servants, and this fury will be shown to his foes. See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his chariots are like the whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury, and will rebuke with flames. For with fire and with the sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people and many will be slain by the Lord. Those who consecrate and purify themselves will go into the gardens, following one who is among those who eat the flesh of pigs, rats, and other unclean things. 
They will meet their end together with the one they follow, declares the Lord. And I, because of what I have planned and done, am about to come and gather the people from all the nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send them Send some to those who survived the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans, to the Lydians, famous archers, uh, to Tubal and Greece and the distant islands and all that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim the glory of uh, among the nations, my glory among the nations, and they will bring all your people from all nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and wagons and on mules and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. And I will select some of them to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and your descendants endure from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another. All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord, and they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Now that's the end of Isaiah. Personally, I would have liked to be ended on a little more upbeat note than that last verse. But I think it's the appeal of the prophet. The prophet who's speaking for the Lord. This is his last chapter. Now granted, when Isaiah wrote, he didn't write in chapters. Those were added later. But this is his last section of scripture. And what he is saying is there's two kinds of people. There are those people who are going to be following the way of God. And it's going to be a beautiful thing. And how can you recognize those people? Let's see, I have a verse here. Here we are. Let me move this out of the way. These are the ones I look on with favor. Okay, here's your secret. What does God want from you? What does God want from me? Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. That's what God wants from you. Have a humble spirit, contrite, and when you hear God's word, you tremble. And the tremble is a sense of awe, a, a sense of wonder. Uh, one of my favorite scenes in the movie called Luther, I think it came out maybe 15 years ago. Um, and it's a well-made movie about Martin Luther. But in the movie, you see him give the German king a copy of a Bible in German. Now, mind you, this man, nor anyone in Germany, except for a few priests, has ever read the Bible. None of them, because it was only in Latin. And here Martin Luther translates the Bible into German, in fact, that translation into German still is the basis for the, the best kind of German to this day. But in the movie, they, they show, I think it's Frederick, if I remember the king's name. He's receiving the Bible, and his hands are like this, because he is about to read the words of God, never before. But that trembling is appropriate. Because the Bible tells us how we should live. What does God think? We approach it with awe. You want to know what God wants? That's what he wants. Now, what does he not want? Well, that shows up in this other area, the verses that follow. Verse 3. But those who sacrifice a bull are like the person who kills. Now, what is he meaning here? He's talking about all these people who are doing religious forms. They're doing religious things. And they're thinking that those things make them right with God. And they don't. What God is wanting is that broken person. Remember the story that Jesus told about two people in the temple? There is two people praying. There is that wealthy person 
saying, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like that low-life scum over there. And then the man in the corner is beating his chest and saying, God, forgive me. I'm such a sinner. And, the, and Jesus says, it's that second man that God heard the prayer of, not the first man. These folks that God finds so repugnant are people who are caught up on the images of religion, but not understanding and appreciating what they should be or could be in relation to just being a broken person before God. That is how we get to God. In the New Testament, you acknowledge for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's your first step to recognize you need Jesus. And then when you realize that, you can receive the grace that only comes from Jesus. Is it something that's easy to understand that we actually celebrate a crucified king, a crucified Lord? Yeah, it is a mystery. But when you realize the depth of your sin, you realize if there is a God who is just, there needs to be payment for sin. Except God, instead of giving the payment to us, gave it to his son. And what he wants from us is a broken heart to receive it. So this whole section from verse 3 downward is this mocking sarcasm of these people who think they have it all together, but God actually finds them repugnant. And uh, they, like verse 5 says, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. That's a mocking statement of these people. Um, hear the uproar from the city. Hear the noise from the temple. It is a sound of the Lord. This whole section is begun with this statement in the beginning of chapter 66 that God doesn't live in a temple. At best, the temple is a footstool. And what these people were getting consumed with is that it's all about the temple. That really, that's what it's all about. But it's not about the temple. It's not about this pristine piety. It is about having a contrite heart. That is what God is looking for. But then he talks about this change that comes. And what this change is, it's that for the good people, for the people who are not caught up, with thinking that they can pat themselves on the back because of their piety. For the contrite, verse 10, rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her. All you who love her, rejoice greatly with her. All you who mourn over her, for you will nurse and be satisfied at her comforting breasts. And you will drink deeply the delight in her overflowing abundance. For this is what the Lord says. I will extend peace to her like a river. Pastor Steve is tempted to sing here, but he's not going to. Peace like a river. Okay, I'm being good. And wealth of nations like a flooding stream. You will nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knee. If you could just get this picture. The image is of a mother nursing her baby and then jumping the baby on her knee. You know, and... They see the baby giggling. They see the baby happy. The baby's in a good place. That is such a beautiful picture. And that he says, these are the people who are the contrite ones. These are the ones who are humble. They will know that comfort. Comfort is a big word in part two of Isaiah. It's shown up seven times. It began. That was the very first word of Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people. And now as Isaiah wraps up, the word shows up again. And if you could just, I mean, isn't there a part of you that craves that you could just be that baby again in, in your mom's arms that just loves you and cares for you and keeps you warm and you're never hungry? Somebody's changing you, taking care of you. It, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful image. That's what we have. Verse 14, when you see this, your heart will rejoice and you will flourish like grass. And the hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants. But his fury will be uh, shown to his foes. See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his chariots are like a whirlwind. So once again, here comes the contrast. Those who follow the Lord, his servants, the contrite ones, the humble ones, and the arrogant ones, the ones who think piety is the way to go, the ones who think they have the proper righteousness because they're doing the right religious stuff. 
And ironically, God's coming to the broken one. He's coming with wonderful comfort. To the arrogant, prideful, piety one, he's coming with judgment. And this is where, when you read the book of the Revelation, you see a lot of these themes coming in, in, into uh, fruition. Verse 17, those who consecrate and purify themselves go into the gardens. Beautiful thing. Following the one who is among them and those who eat the pigs, the rats, and the unclean things, they will meet their end with the one that they follow. So if you're using the book of Revelation, they're following the Antichrist. They're following Satan. They're following the prince of this world. And I, verse 18, because of what they have planned and done, am about to come and gather the people from all nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. Now, this is very special in Isaiah. Isaiah is not writing a little book to a little people. He's writing a big book to a world, and his vision is grand. He is seeing a day when Mongolians will come to faith. He is seeing a day when people from Mozambique will come to faith, from Brazil, from Colombia, from Nicaragua, from Denmark, from Germany, from Russia, from Hungary, from Greece, from Turkey, from Sudan. He sees that day. I will set a sign among them. I will send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish. Remember Tarshish? That is the place where Jonah ran to. That comes up as being a place on the ends of the earth. And so he's saying, I'm sending people all the way away to Libyans, to Lydians, uh, to Tubal, to Greece, to distant islands. Now we've talked about when islands comes up in Isaiah, it usually refers to distant lands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. I, I remember John Piper saying in a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. He says these words. That mission exists. The reason why churches go on mission is because there are places in this world that worship does not exist. And so we want to go out as missionaries so people can discover the joy and wonder of worshiping our great God. John Piper says it this way too. He calls it Christian hedonism. Now hedonism is to satisfy your flesh but he says it in a, just a beautiful way. He says, how do you glorify a fountain? By drinking deeply of that fountain. How do you glorify God? By worshiping him. And this is his point, that you are most happy, most full of joy, most full of wonder when you can worship the Lord your God. And so here is his vision. They will proclaim my glory among the nations, all the nations will have a chance to receive and hear. And they will bring all your people from the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering for the Lord on horses, in chariots, and wagons, on mules, and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites will bring grain offerings and to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. The beautiful thing is these contrite people, they are clean through Jesus Christ, through the work of the servant, Isaiah 53. And here's an amazing thing. He's going to take those goyim, those non-Jewish people, and he's going to say, yeah, some of you can serve as my priests. Some of you can serve as my Levites, my, my ones who are those special called apart ones. The sense is, Paul talks about this in the book of Romans, about being grafted in. We, the nations, having that chance to be part of it all. But now comes the twist. As the new heavens and the new earth I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your name and your descendants endure from the one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. On and on and on, eternal presence, 
with the Father in glory. But now comes the words of the prophet, the twist that says, sober up. Take a look at what you're doing. It says here, and they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. Men who were shaking their head, sad. The worm that eat them will not die. And the fire that burns them will not be quenched. And they will be loathsome to all mankind. Now this theme is picked up. Let's see if I have it here. Yes, this is Mark. And it's, this is Jesus speaking. And if your eye causes you to stumble, this is uh, the Mark version of the Sermon on the Mount. Plug it out. For it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where, and now here comes the quote from Isaiah, the worms that, are, that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. That's Jesus quoting Isaiah talking about hell. So it's a very, very sober word. And then, if you remember a passage in the book of Acts, King Herod is after Jesus ascended into heaven, and Herod is giving a speech in a place called Caesarea. And I've been to the, the uh, amphitheater that he gave the speech. It's still there to this day. And he, Herod is dressed in this luminescent outfit that when the sun hits it, it makes him glow. And the people started shouting, this is the, the, the voice of a God, not a man. The voice of a God, not a man. And the text says, because he did not give glory to God. Here's what we read. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Pretty gross. By the way, his dramatic death is recorded in extra biblical material. I believe it is Josephus who records that event. But my point as we wrap up Isaiah is this. There is a choice. Do you remember in the beginning of Isaiah? There was a choice that Ahaz had. Is he going to follow the way of the Lord? Trust the Lord? Or try to make a deal with the Assyrians? Hezekiah had this choice. Are you going to trust in uh, the Assyrians, or are you going to trust in the Lord? Isaiah had this choice when he realized the glory of the Lord in Isaiah 6. And he said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my, my eyes have seen the king. But then a seraphim took a coal, placed it in his mouth, and he was cleansed. And he was commissioned to preach to a dull people that would not get it. But then Isaiah continued to unfold, and we came to Isaiah 40, where a whole new world was un unfolded to us, where we, we heard those, those marvelous words, but they who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not go weary. They shall walk and not faint. And we're introduced to the servant who is this gentle man who, who will not even break a, bre a reed that's, that's broken or, or snuff out a smoldering wick. And we finally find that the servant is the one who was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brings us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And then we moved to that next part of I Isaiah where there's a choice. As we move into the kingdom of God, are you going to live righteously, which means caring for the weak, caring for the poor, caring for the homeless, or are you going to live religiously and just try to obey all the laws while you ignore all those who are, are sick and dying around you? But there was a champion coming, and behold, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And those words that were ultimately uttered by Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth, that he is the servant that was come when he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled. And then finally, tonight, the choice is yours. The contrite, broken, humble heart or the arrogant, religious person who just doesn't get it. The humble person who receives grace 
comes to a glorious new world order where it's going to be beautiful and there is comfort. But the one who, as one scripture says, sins with the high hand to God, well, there is judgment. And those sober words end this passage and the book of Isaiah. What's your choice? I would quote Joshua at the end of his book. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you guys for being a part of Isaiah. I hope you got something out of this class. I know I did. I miss you guys. Look forward to seeing you. Hope some of you can come next week. God bless.